everyone and welcome back to Neuropsychology. So today we are going to cover um, the neural aspect of language. Uh, we're going to talk about three ways to describe language brain areas. And we're going to talk about two famous brain areas that have been around. Um, these terms have been around for a very, very long time. We're going to talk about Broca's area and Wernicke's area. And then we're going to talk about two different models of connectivity. So the older model is called the Wernicke uh, Geschwind model, which you can see right here in this picture. And the other model kind of built upon that, but has more details uh, and it's a little bit different. And that one is called the dual language pathways. So in the dual language pathways, um, there's also a dorsal and a ventral stream, just like we covered in the visual system. It's not the same thing, but it kind of extends on it. So we'll cover that in full detail in a later slide in this video. Okay, so current ideas about where in the brain language processes are located come from several basic lines of inquiry. So uh, we get information from anatomical studies, um, also from studies of brain lesions in human patients, and actually also studies of brain stimulation in awake human patients. And this is often when people have epilepsy of some sort. And lastly, also in brain imaging studies. However, our knowledge of which brain regions um, exactly account for different parts of language is very, very far from complete. So um, still a lot of research is done on this topic. But therefore, the anatomical landmarks researchers use to describe brain regions that are associated with language vary considerably and undergo constant revision. So some researchers will refer to salsi and gyri. Um, you can see that right here. Um, and some re researchers will refer to Broadman area, as you can see right here. So all these numbers um, are specific to a specific Brahman area and other researchers uh, will refer to different areas around the lateral uh, sulcus um, such as Heschel's gyrus right here or the anterior posterior superior temporal plane and you can see or here you see the anterior superior temporal posterior plane here the posterior one um, etc so these are three very different ways of describing brain regions that are associated with language. So here you see an anatomical map of what they call Broca's area. So Broca's area basically includes area 44 and 45, which you can see right here with all its subdivisions. So, um, but actually, it has been suggested that regions around there are also involved in language, including area six, as you can see in green. And area six is the ventral premotor area. So you guys should already have an understanding what this area is involved with. Hint, hint, muscles, facial muscles. <laughs> so Broca's area was discovered by a physician called Paul Broca. And he had a patient with a lesion to Brahman areas 44 and 45. So he was able to comprehend speech and understand it, but he was not able to produce speech. So his speech production was not intact. So the only thing this patient could say was the word tan. So he would say tan, 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 tan. Um, and later on, they gave him the nickname uh, of patient tan. So from this, it was concluded that these areas, Brahman areas 44 and 45, were very important for speech production. And then premotor area 6 uh, is also related to language because it is associated with your facial movements, your facial muscles. And this area also contains mirror neurons. So this area is important for rhythmic mouth movements, uh, that articulates sound. So when there is damage to Broca's area, this will result in expressive aphasia. So aphasia, the term aphasia, is the loss of ability to understand or express speech, and this is caused by brain damage. 
So expressive aphasia, also known as Broca's aphasia, is a type of aphasia characterized by partial loss of the ability to produce language, both spoken and written. However, comprehension of language generally remains intact. So a person with expressive aphasia will exhibit effortful speech. They have to work very hard to be able to produce language. Okay, and then next up is Wernicke's area. And Wernicke's area is also called Wernicke's speech area. So this is also an area in the brain that is associated with speech. So the name comes from Dr. Carl Wernicke. He was a German neurologist who related neural diseases to specific areas in the brain. And he identified Wernicke's area and that it was uh, involved with the comprehension of language. So remember, Broca's area was the production of language. Wernicke's area is involved with the comprehension of language. Um, so specifically, Wernicke's area is involved with the comprehension of written and also spoken language. And this is in contrast to Broca's area, which is for the production of language. And traditionally speaking, Wernicke's area is taught to be Brotman's area 39 and 40, which are located in the superior temporal lobe, which you can see right here, you have the temporal lobe, here you have the inferior temporal gyrus, middle temporal gyrus, and superior temporal gyrus. We went over the gyri in a video all the way at the beginning of class. Um, and it is in your dominant hemisphere. So in 95% of right-handed people, um, this is in your left hemisphere, and also in 60% of left-handed people, it is in the left hemisphere. So damage or lesion to Wernicke's area will result in fluent aphasia. So fluent aphasia means that the person uh, with this aphasia will be able to fluently connect words, but the phrases or the sentences will lack meaning. So the words are correct, but the sentence does not make sense. So let's say, for example, a person would say, um, the, sentence, the following sentence. So you, um, you know that dog played and that I need to wash clothes while I see you next week. So the words, they're correct, but the whole sentence like string together does not make any sense. Okay, so then Dr. Broca and Dr. Wernicke um, they identify these speech areas in patients, and these uh, patients had these lesions due to a stroke. So then Dr. Wernicke, he added something to it, and he created an early neurological model of language to say how these areas were connected to each other. And then later on, there was a doctor called uh, Dr. Geschwind, and he added to this model. So now this model is called the Wernicke Geschwind model. So this model was entirely based on lesion data. And this three part model proposes that comprehension is extracted from sounds in Wernicke's area. So Wernicke is very important for comprehending sounds. And then it will be moved over to a pathway called the arcuate fasciculus to Broca's area, and here it will be articulated as speech. So the arcuate fasciculus is a neural pathway which technically connects Wernicke's area and Broca's area. So here you see a picture of that. So here you have Wernicke's area in uh, yellow. It is in the superior temporal gyrus, and Broca's area is a part of the inferior frontal gyrus. So sound will be produced um, comprehension of sound will happen in Wernicke's area, then through the arcuate fasciculus, which is a white matter pathway all the way here in the brain, it goes to Broca's area, and here it will be articulated as speech. So here the sound production happens. So sound comprehension, and then this information gets sent to Broca's area, and sound production 
and you say something. Okay, so the Wernicke Giga Schwinz model is actually very, very old, and newer, more contemporary language models has come out after that. So in this one, in this more contemporary language mo uh, model, based on more recent anatomical and behavioral studies, it added more connections to the older model. So you can see the model right here. You see four arrows in red and orange and blue and in green. Um, and in this model, the temporal and frontal cortices are connected by pairs of dorsal and ventral language pathways. So these are not the exact same as the dorsal and ventral visual streams, but they are kind of viewed as extensions of the dorsal and ventral visual streams. So I want you to note that these arrows are double-headed. This means that information goes, uh, goes both ways. So here, the information from vision enters into the auditory language pathways via the dorsal and ventral visual streams and contributes to reading. In this model, the dorsal pathway goes to the temporal cor uh, cortex. So specifically, um, from the temporal cortex, it will go to the frontal cortex, specifically area 6 and 44. And then the ventral pathway goes from temporal, um, temporal cortex to frontal cortices area 45 and 47. So the dorsal pathway right here goes a little bit more uh, posterior and the ventral pathway will go a little bit more anterior. So this is more anterior, or more in front of where the dorsal pathway communicates to. So very, very simplified. The dorsal language pathway is proposed uh, to transform sound information into other motor representation. So it converts phonological information, so sound information, into articulation. And what is that associated to? To sound production. So articulation is sound production. And then we have the ventral language pathway. Um, and these are proposed to transform sound information into meaning. So basically, these two pathways or the ventral, both the ventral pathways convert phonological information, so sound, into semantic information, which is meaning. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna talk about a method that I haven't really brushed up on in the methods section, and then we're gonna talk about one study of how Broca's area was subdivided. So a method I wanted to talk about is called TMS, or transcranial magnetic stimulation. And it's actually really cool because it is used to study cortical function. So TMS is a H-shaped machine, as you can see in the image, and it uses a magnetic field to create a tempor uh, temporary cortical lesion. So if you, for example, would put this machine on the back of your brain, what do you think would happen? So if you, put, if you create a temporary cortical lesion, it's not invasive, to the back of your brain, what would happen? So technically, you will temporarily not be able to see because your visual cortex is all the way at the back of the brain in your occipital lobe. Sounds kind of scary, huh? <laughs> it's actually really funny um, because when that happens, it, it kind of seems scary when you can literally just not see for a, a brief moment. However, this procedure is not invasive at all and is, it is completely temporary. So whenever the machine is taken away, you can see again. So TMS has actually been uh, used to map speech regions in the brain. So I wanted to go over uh, TMS stimulation uh, of Broca's area. So I'm not going to go into detail of all the TMS studies and how they mapped speech uh, language zones in our brain, but I did want to highlight one involving Broca's area since it kind of connects nicely with the model we just talked about, the last model. So TMS has been used to map subdivisions of Broca's area. So a number of brain imaging studies suggest that the anterior regions of Broca's area, so the regions a little bit more in front, are implicated in semantic processing, 
which is technically the processing um, of meaning of words. And then the posterior regions of Broca's area are implicated in phonological processing, which is the production of word. So this sounds familiar, right? Because um, when we talked about this pathway, we saw that the most more posterior area and the frontal region are for sound production and the more anterior regions are for giving a semantic meaning. So in a study using TMS, participants were presented with word pairs on a computer screen and required to decide whether these words meant the same thing. So for example, gift and presents, or if these uh, words sounded the same, but had a different meaning. So for example, key and K. So key is another word for wharf. So these sound very similar. So when they stimulated the anterior region of Broca's area using TMS, it increased reaction time for semantic condition, but not for phonological condition. And when they stimulated the posterior region of Broca's area, it increased reaction time for the uh, phonological condition, but not the semantic condition. So taking back from the slide, the anterior part of Broca's area is really important for semantic processing. So adding meaning to words and disrupting this will create errors in meaning. And the posterior part of Broca's area is important for phonological processing. So for um, sound production and disrupting this will create errors in sound production. And this was the end of this chapter and I will see you guys back soon for the next chapter.